Hey, hi everyone, this is Selva. In this one, we will try to understand the isolation forest algorithm very clearly. We will first understand the concepts completely. Then we will see how to use it for outlier detection on, on a real data set using Python. So this is implemented in the scikit-learn package itself. We will use the same. Now we have been looking at various different algorithms for outlier detection. We saw we saw Cook's distance, we saw Mahalanobis distance. We also saw Z-score and the box plot based approach. In that sequence, isolation forest is also a multivariate based approach for outlier detection. What, what I mean by that is you have a data set you have a data set, you have lot of different columns, just like how we used all the columns of the data set to find the outliers for Mahalanobis and Cook's distance. I will leave a link to, the, to those videos in the description, you can check it out. So in those approaches, we used all the columns in the data to find out who are the, which of these rows are outliers. Out, isolation forest also is on the similar principles, but uses a completely different approach. Now for the sake of understanding, we will not use the entire data set for, to make the understanding clear, let's, uh, let's assume we will use the, just the first two features, x1 and x2, we have two features. We will take these two features alone to understand the algorithm behind isolation forest. The same logic can be extended to all the different features present in the data. So let's say, let's assume we have this data set, which has just two features right now, we will take just two, two features and when you plot them, if you plot them on a graph, if you plot them on a graph, let's say you have x1 here and x2 on the y-axis and you have various data points, you have various data points, alright, you have various data points, lot of data is present. Now few outliers might also be present, here we have one outlier, we have, here we have one, here we have one, okay. So this is the data it looks like. How isolation forest works is, it's based on the principle that the extreme data points, that, that is the outlier data points, are quite easy to segregate compared to the rest of these data points. What do I mean by that? Let us understand it in more detail. Now if you look at the name isolation forest, it contains the element forest, the, the word forest here. So this is something that it shares in common with a very another very popular algorithm which is random forest. Random forest also has the word forest in it and there is some similarity to it. But in terms of the application, random forest is a machine learning algorithm we will use for predicting some variable. It could be a numeric variable or it could be a categorical variable, but it does prediction. Whereas isolation forest is also a machine learning algorithm, but it is used to predict if a given data point is an outlier or not. Just this purpose, no other prediction purposes. All right? It always predicts if a, given, if a given data point is an outlier or not. That is all there is to it. Now, the, the difference between these two, okay, uh, we saw the difference between them. The, the similarity between them is the word forest here, right? So in terms, in, in random forest, we have the term forest means it's a collection of trees. So we, have, we, have, we will be building a lot of decision trees. Decision trees is another machine learning algorithm. So we basically build a lot of decision trees here and aggregate them to form random forest. Isolation forest is also on a similar principle, but it is not really a decision tree. It also builds a certain type of a tree, which is completely randomized when we are building the tree, randomized tree. All right, you can call it randomized tree, I don't know what the real name is, but the tree that we are building when we are building the isolation forest is completely randomized. What do we, what do we mean by that? Let's, let's take this case, right? So we have these two variables. Now, these two features alone, all right, let's call this x1 as age for the sake of understanding and x2 as salary, x1 and x2 as salary. Now we said that this is completely randomized way of building your trees. What we will do is we will iteratively keep on creating a lot of rules. That is we will use these rules to split this data set into smaller parts. All right. We will keep on splitting it. We will keep on splitting it. All right. We will keep on splitting it until all of these records here in this data, all of these points, all of these points, all, all of these points gets segregated out as individual data points. So for example, we will randomly pick one of these two features. The first iteration will randomly pick one of these two features. Say we picked x1 which is age. All right. Now within age, we know that say age varies between 0 and 100. It varies between 0 and 100. We will pick a random value of age, say 25. All right. Here 25 lies. All right. Initially, I hope this one will be legible. So initially, let's say this data set contains 1000 observations. 1000 observations and we are making a rule based on this criterion. So we will make a rule that the first split is based on the rule that age is lesser than 25. 
alright. If age, the rule is age, it means a different color, age, age lesser than 25, alright. If it is 25, yes, lesser than 25, it goes into this node. If it is not less than 25, it goes into the other node, alright. So, this is no, this is no, alright. So, let us say about 250 data points is yes, 750 data points is no, alright. Now, again we will pick one more time between these two these two features, we will pick one random feature, maybe this time x2 got picked, salary got picked and say the salary ranges from 0 to 1 million, 1 million and we will pick a random value say 100,000 dollars something here, alright. And we will draw a, we will draw a split over here, this splits the data point. So, here earlier in the first split, we split the data into less than 25 and greater than 25. So, we, we split the data into 2. Now, again we are splitting the data, right, we are splitting this data set that is this data, this part, this is 250 data points, this is 750 data points. Now, the 250 data points, we are making a split here, right. So, here we are checking if salary, salary is less than 100,000, 100k dollars, alright. Now, here we are doing the split, this is 100k, let us say 100k, this point, yeah. Here we are making a split and this is splitting this 250 data points into say again 100 and 150. 150 data points. Like this, we keep on splitting this entire data, we keep on splitting this entire data, we keep on splitting this entire data until we reach a point. So, sometimes until we, until we reach a point where all of these data points form one, one particular node. So, all these are, this is the root node, the very end, the very beginning is the root node and these are the intermediate nodes. The one that is the end, it is the terminal node. Terminal node means it, it cannot be split further, terminal, terminal node, node or simply the leaf, we call it also the leaf. So, this is the root and this is the leaf, right. So, this way we are splitting the entire data set. Now, what remember what we said initially, we said that the, the outlier, the extreme values here, the outlier data points are easier to segregate. Whereas, the points in the in, in the right in the center, right? The points right in the center are very difficult to segregate. What we mean by that is, it takes. Let me clear. Let me let me form a new screen. It takes it takes lesser 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 number of splits, lesser number of splits splits to segregate to segregate regular data points. Okay, not regular, the outlier data points, outlier data points, alright. So, what is the number of splits? So, the number of splits you should require to segregate a data point is what we call as the path length, the path length, right. Suppose if we need 10, 10 different splits, 10 different rules to split out one single data point, then the path length of that, that specific data point would be 10. For example, we have a very nice, we have a very nice representation in the Wikipedia page for isolation forest, en.wikipedia.org, we are at isolation forest. Now, look at this diagram, we have a point here right in the middle, right here in the middle, right. And all of these orange lines are nothing but splits that we are doing in order to segregate this particular data point. So, you make a split here and then you make a split here and then you make a split here, 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 so many splits are there, okay. If you count at least more than 10 splits will be coming here. Is it right? Whereas, if you take a point that is towards the peripherals, right, you just need to split it here once and another split over here. Just two splits are sufficient to make this, to segregate this data point out, right. Maybe this data point can be segregated by this, just one, one split here, alright. If you draw one line here, this might get segregated out, alright. Now, the thing is, all, every time we, we the, the way that we are doing the splitting is completely randomized, right. So, in one random occurrence, like in one random split that we are making, it might require one, one iteration, one single split might be needed and sometimes in order to split this particular data point, you might need three splits or four splits or even five splits, right. It is not always one, we, we are not going to find this particular point in the very first shot, right. You might need more than one split, sometimes are more, more number of splits might be needed in various different randomized trials. Now, in order to, in order to standardize this, 
Now in order to come to a consensus about which of these data points require lesser number of splits to segregate them, we do this tree building process multiple times. So the randomized trees get built multiple times. So imagine we had the original data, right? We had the data, we have various rows present here, rows row number go from 1, 2, 3, 4 all the way to, 10, to n and we have various different columns here, various different columns here, right? Now, zero. Now while building the tree, we decide to build say 100 different trees, all right? We will aggregate, aggregate the results. So we decide to build 100 different trees, 100 different trees. So we will, we will draw 100, okay, let, let's take all these rows here, all these rows present in the data to columns, to columns. This is, this is row 1, this is row 2, we are transposing this, the rows here goes to columns row 3, so on and so forth to row n, alright. And the very first iteration is nothing but building the very first tree, alright. Then we build the second tree, we build the third tree, so on and so forth, we build 100 trees, right. Now in this one, to segregate the first row, the first time, we might have taken, we might have taken say 5, the path length would have been 5, right. 5 splits might be required to segregate this particular data point. Likewise, to segregate the second point, it might have required say 20 splits. All right. But in the second iteration, the first data point could have been split using just two splits. In the third iteration, it might have required seven splits. In the fourth iteration, it could have required just one split. We don't know. I am just making things up. All right. So every time you are building or creating your trees, different number of splits might be needed for every other row present in the data. Isn't it? But overall, overall, there is good amount of variation here. After doing enough number of trials, we will simply take a mean of all these trials, all right. If you take a mean of this, this, this might come around say 3.5, this might come, this might have, the second row might have slightly larger value, say 25 splits might be needed on an average. Likewise, we average out for all the different rows. So these are, these are, these are, this is the 3.5 is the average path length to segregate the first row, right. So we compute the average, the mean, the mean path lengths path length of all the rows, those observations that is having the lowest path length to segregate, those are the outline data points. So basically what we do is we compute these path lengths, sort them in ascending or descending order, the, the data points that is having the lowest path lengths, right, those are the ones that we are interested in and those typically are going to be the data points that we are going to call as outliers. Now this is how it works, let's now try to implement in Python. This can be directly implemented using, using the scikit-learn package, it is present inside the ensemble module, you can, you can import, we are importing the isolation forest object, this class, then num, pandas, pandas, numpy and warnings to ignore the, ignore the warnings and we are using the churn modeling data set, we have seen this data set, data set in the past. The objective is this contains various, the information about various different customers. We want to know, we want to know which of these customers are likely to churn. So this, who, which of the customers churned, that information is present here. Now, the objective in this problem here is, we want to know who are the abnormal customers, who are the outlier or the, the using isolation for us, which, which customers are extreme, which, which customers are very different from the rest of the customers. We are taking few numeric rows such as the credit score, balance, estimated salary, age, excited, exited, alright. It is arbitrarily chosen, you might pick up even more rows also you know, if you want to do this, right. And we are forming the training data set and it contains the first few, ro few rows looks like this. Now we are ready to build or train the isolation forest model. Now initialize the model, the same standard flow that we will use, always use for scikit-learn but one small change. I'll tell, I'll tell that. So initialize this, this is like the number of parallel jobs that you want to run, depending on the number of cores in your system, you can choose this. Then random state, if you want to want isolation forest to be able to reproduce the same result every time, you need to set the same random state. It doesn't matter what number you set here, but as long as you set the same number, you should be able to reproduce your same results. Then you have the contamination ratio. So what this tells is, this, we are saying that one percentage of all the data points are outliers. So isolation forest will tell you which of all amongst all the rows present in the data. So in this data we have thousand rows, thousand rows. Now by stating that contamination is one percent, we are saying that one percentage of one percentage of thousand, which is I think hundred data points, 
Now, one percentage of thousand is ten data points. I think we have ten thousand data points in the data set. Ten thousand data points. So, one percentage of this number would be hundred data points. So, this number of data points are outliers is what we are stating here. All right. So, we we don't know what the value should be here. All right. So, what we will do is we will first run isolation for us, get the abnormal data points or the outlier data points. We will examine the values present inside it. All right. If we feel that okay, this contains good number of average or regular customers inside them, we might go back here. We will come back here and change this number to say 0.005, make it as 0.5 percentage, and rerun this and look at the top 50 of outliers. If we, if you feel that this is also too 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 much of a problem, some some normal observations are present here, you might reduce it even further, even further to 0.001 percentage. Like that, you might want to do few iterations of training your isolation forest to come up with the right value of contamination. All right, so this is set up. We have we have this set up. Train your model, pass in just the X train. We are not passing any Y here. There is no concept of Y. Just all your columns that is present in your data, pass them to CLF fit function, fit method. Then use CLF dot predict. Pass in the data again. Now this is going to tell us whether a given data point is an outlier or not. If it is an outlier, it will mark it with a minus one. So exactly, if you do a value counts on the predicted y values, predicted values, exactly hundred of them are marked as outliers. Remaining nine nine thousand nine hundred is regular data points. And if you look at it, if you look at what are the data points that are marked as minus one, and you can see these are the hundred data points marked as minus one, oh, that is as outliers. Now here you will observe something about some of some of the other columns about most of these data points are kind of extreme. Say here you can see that this is uh, the maximum value of credit score it can take, right? These these observations, these observations. This is the lowest value of credit score. Three fifty is the lowest value possible. And here you have the lowest balance, right? Here you have a very large balance, lowest val balance again. And estimated salary is also very high here in these cases. In these cases, so something about the data points is will be very abnormal, right? This I'm not sure what the problem with this is. Maybe this is a very high value of high credit score, but nothing, nothing specifically abnormal here. I'm, I'm noticing. Maybe I'm missing something, but yeah, maybe if, if this is the case, we want to remove this as a, we want to consider this as a regular data point. We might reduce the value of the contamination percentage and rerun the whole logic. So that's the whole intuition, logic, and the steps behind how isolation forest algorithm is built, and we have also implemented in Python. I will leave a link to this notebook in the description if you want to try it out yourself. And if I happen to publish this as a blog, I will leave that link also in the description. Till then, I'll see you in the next one.